Earlier in 2019, JetBlue announced that they would commence flights to London from their two main hubs, uh, Boston and New York, JFK, uh, sometime in 2021. They would use the A321LR, which is an upgraded version of the A321neo, uh, with additional fuel tanks in the wings. They also announced plans to take on uh, A321XLRs starting in 2023 which could see JetBlue possibly fly farther than just the British Isles. Um, this announcement had been long awaited as JetBlue executives in the past have discussed wanting to get into London, but uh, they needed the right plane to, to do it. Uh, the public's reaction to the announcement has largely been extremely positive as flying with JetBlue is usually seen as a comfortable experience with ample leg room and low cost. It's that low cost that people are really excited about. Due to extremely consistent demand, New York to London is one of the most profitable routes in the entire world for airlines. Notably, British Airways, who makes over $1 billion annually on the route alone. These large margins have started to slightly shrink ever since Norwegian Airlines entered the London to New York scene in the summer of 2014. And in fact, ever since then, Norwegian has remained the cheapest on average nonstop New York to London option. Uh, but there's the potential problem. Norwegian Airlines is a future interline partner of JetBlue. As of December 2019, the current plan is that starting sometime in 2020, customers will be able to fly transatlantic via Norwegian to Boston, New York, or to Fort Lauderdale and then from there make a seamless connection onto a JetBlue flight all under one booking, which is a pretty great partnership since both carriers are esteemed for premium in-flight product uh, for low reasonable costs. But what happens when JetBlue starts flying New York to London? Do the two carriers suddenly become competitors? Does the entire partnership stop? Or does the partnership get upgraded to a joint venture where bilateral schedules are created and profits are shared. Obviously nothing is concrete, otherwise I wouldn't be speculating. However, some options are more likely than others. First of all, JetBlue and Norwegian, they wouldn't be getting into this partnership if they didn't hope it'd, it'd last long term. Norwegian obviously knows of JetBlue's intention to get into London, so the chances of the partnership eroding just because of one shared route is unlikely. The two likely scenarios are the following. Both carriers fly the route regardless of whether the interline agreement carries over to that route. Or if passengers have positive experiences with this JetBlue Norwegian partnership, I could see the two apply to become a joint venture. If all regulators approved, they'd be able to openly plan with one another things like pricing, scheduling, and other strategies essentially acting as one airline on the route. This wouldn't be a first for the corridor. There are already two powerhouse partnerships that fly between New York and London. You have Virgin Atlantic and Delta, and British Airways and American Airlines. Between these two partnerships, you can basically fly at any time of day to either city, earning miles on your preferred airline's card. Additionally, JetBlue has not publicly announced which of the many London airports it plans to fly to, likely because they're still negotiating with potential candidates. But it is possible JetBlue won't fly to London Gatwick, which is where Norwegian is based. If that were to happen, I'm not sure a joint venture would be as enticing, since passengers wouldn't be able to make connections. For now, no one really knows what the future holds, but my best bet is that Norwegian and JetBlue try to work as closely together as possible, seeing how successful similar partnerships have worked for others. And Norwegian needs success. Yields for the airline have diminished in the past few years due to their rapid expansion and, quite honestly, unreliable fleet. It became so bad that the airline has nearly gone bankrupt numerous times just in the past couple years. At the end of 2018, the airline was in debt for more than $3 billion. That's when the company announced a cost-cutting program in order to turn the situation around. 
the program was deemed Focus 2019. And since we're at the end of 2019, we can ask, did it work? Yes. In Q3 2019, the company boasted a record-breaking $239 million profit. Uh, but here are just some of the measures that they had to take in order to get there. They gave joint ownership to incoming Airbus narrowbodies to Chinese investors, as well as selling some of the orders and delivery slots of those narrowbodies. They axed long-haul flights out of their Copenhagen and Stockholm hubs starting in March 2020. They've canceled intra-European and intra-North American flights. They've also canceled all transatlantic narrowbody operations. They're considering cheaper, unusual narrowbody options such as the Sukhoi Superjet 100. They sold their Argentine subsidiary that was operating exclusively in South America. And ultimately, they delayed bond repayments by two years. So 2019 was challenging for European carriers. Many did not succeed, actually. At least six went under. But Norwegian came out on top and is looking poised to succeed should it remain strategic and conservative for the time being. Speaking of tough times, 2017 was also rough for airlines, especially United. If you recall, the airline stock had fallen more than 5% due to a year that was a bit of a PR nightmare after having numerous stories of pets dying on board and also having a doctor being dragged out of a plane unconscious. Many thought the airline was digging itself into a hole, but fast forward two years and the company has made an admirable turnaround. Here are some of the success stories that have caught my attention. Since the end of 2017, their stock is up 31%. They've utilized their new 787's abilities and have started premier routes to places such as Singapore, Tel Aviv, Cape Town, Dublin, Melbourne, among others. Their Polaris business class seating has been a hit among customers. They've also announced that Mileage Plus award miles will never expire. They gave economy customers a choice of complimentary snacks on domestic flights and have made DirecTV free for every customer on more than 200 aircraft. They've launched a new tool called Connection Saver, dedicated to improving the experience for customers with connecting flights. They've partnered with Clear to make free or discounted memberships for Mileage Plus members. They've invested in customer experience in other creative ways, such as a Star Wars partnership, where they uh, branded a plane with a really cool Star Wars livery, and even produced a limited amount of amenity kits that were Star Wars themed. They've also created plans to create personal jet lag plans for Mileage Plus members uh, based off of their itineraries. They've also settled a big dispute with Expedia and in fact uh, have signed a memorandum of understanding cementing their relationship and to work with them closer throughout the years to come. They've also started a rebranding and a new livery to go along with that, which I personally think looks pretty good actually. And they've just recently announced plans to change out CEOs. Oscar Munoz will be handing over the role to Scott Kirby, who is seen in the industry as having a more hands-on understanding of how airlines work. So needless to say, it's been quite the transformative two years for United. Their future looks pretty good too. Despite being Boeing loyalists, they've recently announced an order for 50 of the superior A321 XLRs, joining American Airlines and looking to Airbus to replace Boeing 757s. I'm sure both companies were likely hoping Boeing would offer a product to replace the aged 757, but currently all they have to offer is a grounded 737 MAX 9 whose range is 1,300 miles fewer than the A321 XLR. United expects to take delivery of the long-range narrowbody starting in late 2024. Speaking of Boeing, that's not the only not-so-great news for them. Boeing's CEO, Dennis Muhlenberg, has reportedly been fired effective immediately. The company's CFO, Greg Smith, will step into the role uh, in the interim until board chairman Dave Calhoun 
permanently steps in on January 13th. We all know about the 737 MAX crisis, so I'll jump right into my analysis. I think this was the wrong move on multiple fronts. First and foremost, the 737 MAX program was conceptualized, approved, designed, and built before Muhlenberg was CEO. Secondly, while Boeing's apologies to the public and the families of the 346 victims did feel a bit forced, that's going to happen when a giant money-focused corporation has to apologize. And that's exactly Boeing's main critique. They're too money-hungry. For example, the 787 is a fantastic product. Earlier I talked about how United is using it for new innovative routes. It alone is responsible for the creation of numerous Asia to North American routes. The plane truly was a game changer in the aviation industry. All because Boeing dove into it and took a chance. Did the program go over budget? Absolutely. Were deadlines consistently missed? Yes. Were there some PR bumps along the way? There sure were. Did it take a couple of years to become profitable? Yes, it did. But it was all worth it. The 787 has been absolutely integral in many airlines. And yet, Boeing board members were absolutely traumatized by the program. So when it was time to make a clean sheet replacement for the 757, the board members dug their heels in and refused. It was not going to happen. So instead, they looked to stretch the already stretched 737. They figured out a way to put their giant floppy new engines on the small bird by tilting them on the front of the wing, making taking off even more risky for the already underpowered aircraft. And to address this, engineers created MCAS, which was designed to help stabilize the aircraft in climbs. But as we know, not all the glitches were ironed out before deployment. And on top of that, Boeing decided to not enforce in-depth training of the system to pilots getting certified on the type. The fact that Boeing had this power to make this decision has angered much of the world, and the FAA and other aviation authorities will be much more scrutinizing from now on because of the backlash. I've digressed, but the point I'm trying to make is that Boeing's reluctancy to create a proper replacement for the 757 is what got them into this mess. They were too focused on short-term profits and not focused on long-term stability via producing a quality product. And now a CEO with an engineering background is being ousted by a board member whose background is in accounting. Just that appointment in itself tells me that Boeing has not learned its lesson, and leadership will continue to chase the short term rather than the long term. Luckily for them and their shareholders, Boeing is a massive company with many divisions, with many bright and talented people that will try to make best of their leadership's demands. These are the people who inevitably will get Boeing up and running again, via both current programs and in-development ones. It's a pretty good segue, because one of those in-development programs is the next thing I want to talk about. Boeing and Porsche are creating an electric personal trans transport drone. Uh, no solid details like investment amounts or deadlines were given, but this looks to be society's first solid chance at personal airborne transport becoming a reality. Artists' renderings of what the vehicle could look like are being shown now. However, I have to say how unlikely I think the final product will look like that, especially considering it's supposed to be all electric. Porsche will be working with Aurora Flight Sciences, a subsidiary of Boeing that works on autonomous drones. In January 2019, Aurora successfully completed test flights of its massive drone that could lift a payload of up to 500 pounds. So I'm personally quite excited to see how this partnership between Boeing and Porsche plays out, and I will be watching it closely. So that's where I'm ending today's show. I hope that you found it informative and that you'll return for more. Aviation is my passion, and I look very much forward to continuing this. If you're interested in more than just the weekly podcast, you could follow my Twitter at Austin Scott underscore TW. If you'd like to contact me, that's also probably the best way. 
Also, I need help. If you'd like to be a part of this show, I'm looking for a video editor with basic skills and a website developer. Feel free to hit me up on Twitter. Thanks for listening.